I think the important job of government is to protect the British people, and the protection of the British people depends on extending the boundaries of the state as far as possible away from the areas of main interest. And for us, that means keeping pandemics, keeping disease away from Britain. And nothing does that better than aid. So we should maintain it. That's our pledge that was in the manifesto that is in law that keeps us as an international superpower when it comes to aid. Look, I, I think that's right. I think the, the, the truth is the UK has and is an international superpower through, through aid because we are one of the few countries that meets both uh, the pledge on aid and the pledge on defence. And that means that we're able to use the appropriate tool for the appropriate challenge. Look, we know that Britain's foreign policy is based on data, diplomacy, aid, trade and arms. And using the right tool for the right job is essential if we're going to get the right result. This is going to require legislation, which suggests the government is going to keep this cut for years because it doesn't need to change the law if it's just for one year. That's my view. So the 2015 Act allows the government to make the change in year, so it goes from 0.7 to 0.5, due to three different conditions. All three of them are satisfied by the COVID crisis. So if the government needs to make this change this year, or indeed even next, or possibly even the year afterwards, it can absolutely do so under the 2015 Act. So I think a change in the law would be a mistake. I do understand why pressure this year may make it uh, necessary, uh, but I do think it would be an error to change the law. And do you think that's something Conservative MPs would vote for? Well, there are certainly many who see aid as an essential part of our influence over, uh, overseas. And, you know, shaping the world around us is what Brexit is about. That is exactly what we're trying to do. We need to get on the front foot and make sure that our voice is heard. But can you have it all? Does the money have to come from somewhere? Of course, when the economy is growing, uh, there's more money. And when the economy is falling, there's less. And that's why the GNI link uh, makes a difference. Look, whatever happened, the DFID budget, sorry, the aid budget was going to fall anyway because it was linked to gross national income. What this does is it shrinks that faster and makes it harder for us to defend ourselves uh, next year or the year after. Do you think they might think again? I mean, when we've seen things will. like school meals overturned in the past, is this one of those ones that could also be overturned? Look, I hope they will. I mean, one of the things I've always been really impressed with Rishi Sunak about is that as Chancellor, he has consistently listened to what people uh, in the party and actually around the country have to say. And I think this is one of those moments where I think he should listen again. This is, you know, he's a Chancellor who really does understand Britain's place in the world. He's absolutely got uh, the idea of a global Britain, and I'm sure he wants Britain to be heard. Uh, and he'll, he can do that by making sure that we are the global superpower on aid that actually makes a difference in people's lives and therefore actually uh, you know, is relevant to countries uh, around the world. Tom Tigenhauer, thank you very much. Well, I've also been speaking to the Treasury Minister John Glenn and Labour's Lucy Powell, the Shadow Business Minister. And I began by asking Lucy Powell about the public sector pay freeze and the Chancellor's announcement about protecting the majority of public sector workers. Well, I don't think the majority of public sector workers have been protected by today. I mean, look, I think what the there's two issues we, we've got with what the Chancellor has announced on, on pay. The first is it's the economically, it's the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong choice to make at this point in time. Pulling back and cutting away at people's ability to spend and their spending power, just as you're trying to emerge out of an economic crisis, is the wrong thing to do. And it's the morally wrong thing to do because, yes, NHS workers are protected, but there are many other frontline workers who really have uh, pulled this country through over the last few months. So do you think any spending cuts can be justified or are they all wrong at this stage? Well, there's not any a case of any spending cuts, but certainly at this point in time, what we should be seeing is uh, the, the Chancellor really coming forward with a stimulus package, a package of government investment, of government uh, expenditure. The, the other cut, obviously, is overseas aid um, by about £4 billion now, that £4 billion is instead going to be spent on deprived communities in Britain to make towns and villages better here, uh, effectively. That's going to be a popular move, isn't it, in truth? Well, it might be a, a popular move, but again, it's the wrong move. I mean, first of all... Well, if it's popular, foreign... how can it be wrong? Popular doesn't always uh, mean right. Let me just explain. I mean, first of all, the, the foreign aid budget is the only government uh, spending that's actually proportionate to, to GDP. 
it, it is also protecting those developing countries, their health services, ensuring that they can deliver the vaccination programme that we're all going to need. And it's going to protect those developing countries in the future from future pandemics and uh, health crisis, which in turn protects our, our, ourselves, doesn't it? Because, you know, this coronavirus pandemic didn't start in this country. It started in another country. Lucy Powell, thank you very much indeed. Um, let me put those points to the minister, John Glenn. The Archbishop of Canterbury has called this overseas aid cut shameful. Uh, you've, your colleague in the House of Lords, the minister, has resigned. There's widespread opposition to this. Are you not ashamed of doing it? It was a very, very difficult decision. I've always supported our commitment to the world's poorest and most vulnerable. But uh, this decision was made in the context of what the Independent Office of Budget Responsibility says is the worst situation that we've had with respect to the economy for 300 years. But that will have direct consequences of this and Britain will be diminished in the world. Well, one of the points that Lucy made was the need to commit to support the, the developing world develop vaccines. And we've continued to play a significant role, in fact, a leading role as a contributor to the mechanism, the COVAX mechanism, to get advanced purchase of, of vaccines for the developing world. How do you answer Labour's criticism that while you're recognising the need for the pain, the payback, to, to, to be delayed until we are through the crisis, for two million public sector workers, you are making them face the pain now. The reality is that when we've got the worst public finances since the Great Frost in 1709, we have to take unprecedented measures. And I would just r remind your viewers that uh, in 2008-9, Chancellor Alistair Darling also put forward plans for a pay freeze. This is not unprecedented, but we have protected the lowest paid public sector workers, uh, and, we, and we've done that because it's the right thing to do. Do you recognise it's difficult for people who see, you know, the cronyism of what's been going on with PPE contracts, people getting rich during this pandemic, uh, buying country houses, then being told they're going to face a real terms pay cut? Well, I recognise that this has been an unprecedented time and the government have had to make decisions uh, very quickly in order to secure the PPE that was necessary. Um, and obviously there'll be a lot to review uh, when this crisis is over. But what we're now focused on is trying to protect as many jobs as we can. Can, can you explain why a month before one of the biggest constitutional and economic changes in British history, Brexit, actually happening at the end of this year, Brexit wasn't mentioned once in the spending review. It's utterly bizarre. Well, well, the spending review is about the public finances for next year, what we're going to spend in public services. Which could be um, terrible, according we, to the OBR. We, yes, I'm aware of what the OBR says and the implications of a no deal, and that's why we're working very hard to secure that deal. And obviously, uh, we, we're seeking to make progress uh, in these uh, days as we approach the end of the transition period. Minister, thank you very much.